just recently, there was the incredible hurricane that uh, devastated Puerto Rico. And we're going to be talking about that and hurricanes that also hurt Cuba. I'll be speaking with uh, Millie Guzman, who uh, works with the Western Mass Boricuas for the Liberation of Puerto Rico. She's been in Cuba for uh, several weeks, I believe, and we'll be talking about that trip. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, Millie, when did you go to Cuba? We went October 1st through the 15th. I assume you had planned that a uh, long time before these hurricanes. Yes, we did. My heart was in Puerto Rico while I was in Cuba helping them with hurricane relief because I my people were suffering. and um, So I was really happy to be helping out in Cuba, but I also was hurting because I knew that my people were suffering. So... Let's get the dates right. Compared to the hurricane that went through Puerto Rico, the second one, when did you go? I went October 1st through the 15th uh, to Cuba for two weeks. And that's right after the... Right after the... the really big one. The big one, Maria, Hurricane Maria, mm -hmm. which had a devastating effect. And, and did you go with a group or by yourself to Cuba? I went with my daughter. She's 11. And I also went with uh, several people throughout Western New England. And also, uh, for example, we had people from Albany, New York, uh, from Massachusetts, from Hartford. Other people went. Um, was it a formal group, an organization, or just a travel agent put it together? How did that? Well, um, the Institute of Friendship of Cuba invited us. They mm -hmm. sent invitations to different groups like the Hartford, Greater Hartford Coalition on Cuba. And so he reached, Tim Crane from that group reached out to me. And then I tried to reach out to my people, my group, in um, Western Mass Boricos for the Liberation of Puerto Rico. And so uh, one of, um, a friend came with us also from that group. So which uh, towns and cities did you go to in Cuba? We were everywhere, all over the island. Sancti Spiritus, we went to Santa Clara, um, Caimito, different places. Um, Havana too? Yes, Havana too. We walked through Havana. Now they suffered from the hurricane. Maria, what about the earlier one? Was Irma, was it? Yes, uh, a lot of water... Um, the water rised up really high. Um, however, when we went there, they have an amazing hurricane um, preparedness. They have these groups that they organize in each neighborhood. They're called CDRs, uh, Civil Defense for the Revolution. And it's not just to protect the people during times of war, for example, if, if, uh, if there's an attack, um, but they also prepare the people for hurricanes and other natural disasters. And I was amazed at what they, how they prepare for these hurricanes. And could you see evidence of the devastation in Cuba? Yes, we did see uh, evidence of it. There were some areas that were still uh, flooded, um, but Havana had, was already um, drained out. Um, uh, within one week, Cuba had electricity for the entire island actually within one week they had 90 a little bit over 90 percent of it and um after a few weeks they had about 100 percent of it done now it's 100 percent and uh, puerto rico in contrast has to wait six to eight months um so i would like to talk more about that well what did cuba do that puerto rico isn't doing well cuba has this plan um they had a huge hurricane, and I believe it was, it was in 1963, and it, 1,300 people died. And from that, they learned that they needed to prepare better for helping the people. And so they developed these CDRs. Um, I went to a panel discussion on how these CDRs are organized. And when I left that panel, on my way out, I wanted to thank the two um, tour guides that were... Uh, standing outside of the facility and I just was so impacted by this CDR and how well organized they are with the hurricane relief 
uh, efforts. And even before the hurricane, they prepare. I was so impacted by that that I couldn't even get my words out to say thank you. I just kept crying and crying because I knew that this plan exists. And my people were dying and being left to die in Puerto Rico from that from the hurricane. So um, I just wanted to go into uh, explain how the CDRs work a little bit. Um, basically, before the hurricane comes, uh, college students from two different organizations come uh, and live. They actually stay in their neighborhoods and they weather the storm. And that takes a lot of courage and love to do that, you know, for, for your your people. So the college students stay. Uh, and then when the storm hits, well, before the storm hits, they evacuate everyone. They go door to door. And the CDRs know exactly who lives where and uh, the first people they evacuate are the most frail members of the community, the elderly, the sick, pregnant women, children. They're, they're all evacuated, and they go door-to-door, -door, like I said, and they even evacuate pets, which is something that um, we don't do in this country. Um, and then after the hurricane, these students that stayed in the, in the area during the storm, they remove the debris, they have the they came prepared with materials to to get rid of trees, to, to cut trees down, or to remove Are, are these them. volunteers, or are they paid? They're volunteers, mm -hmm. and they're from the university. They're students. They're college students. In the meantime, they have already evacuated the people to the university, and, the, and then the Cuban government provides entertainment for them. So while they're um, at the, they're staying at the shelter at the universities, they're being entertained to keep their minds off of the stressfulness of losing so much during a devastating hurricane. Like in Puerto Rico, suicide rate is so high. People are feeling so devastated at what they're seeing around them. Um, Let's talk about Puerto Rico a little bit. First, were you born here or in Puerto Rico? I was born here, and then when I was a teenager, we moved to Puerto Rico, and then I came back in when I was 16. What part of Puerto Rico is your family from? Utuado, Puerto Rico. And where is that? Uh... It's in the center of the island, in the mountains, um, sort of towards the left side of the island. Mm -hmm. And you have family still there? Yes, I have a lot of family there, uncles, aunts, cousins. And Utuado was hit very hard. Um, two of the rivers came out, um, and uh, there's, there were animals that were killed, and so they're... It, it was flood. They were floating in the in the rivers, or that had the carcasses. Right? Yes, and so that leads to a, a lot of um, diseases, and it's just really bad over there. Who did you talk to? Grandparents or others? Yes, we. It was very difficult. Communication was down for a long time. By the time we communicated with my grandmother, it took um, maybe six days. Um, and on the seventh day, we heard about from my uncle, and it was just hor horrible waiting for so long to hear, to see if they were okay. But um, I could hear in the background, we just heard a recording of their voices because um, a friend who used to be a neighbor, actually it took her two hours, what normally would take her a half hour, to reach to my grandmother. And then she made a recording of, of their voices saying, we're okay. Um, and then she. Um, what happened to their house? Your grandparents. Well, their houses are okay, but a lot of there was a lot of flooding in the area, and uh, people the roofs came off the houses, uh, and so a lot of there was a lot of loss. Now that's weeks ago. Now I don't know how many weeks have they been getting given aid, or did they borrow money? Do they have electricity now? No. What happened was. Um, FEMA was blocking a lot of the aid that was coming through. I really don't, I still don't know why they were blocking it. But um, before I left to Cuba, the governor of Puerto Rico was saying that he needed truck drivers and, and um, so then, tr and, and trucks too. So truck drivers came with licenses, but they were rejected. So it was not lack of, of truck drivers. Um, that was an excuse. And the military was saying that they were not receiving orders. So you had the military, you had FEMA, you had the governor of Puerto Rico. Nobody was doing anything for weeks. 
people were starving. They didn't have water. Um, even um, we had a speaker come to CCSU just last week, and he was telling us that they reached a, a, an older couple that said nobody has come by with water or anything, even till this day. It, that was just like a week ago. So, um, and there's private groups trying to help out. Can you name a few? I just uh, wanted to say that um, there are. We're grateful to church groups, for example, that were um, on the ground helping out. And uh, also, there's a group called Doctoras Boricuas uh, of their own free will. They were volunteering in hospitals throughout different municipalities, and they noticed that the patients were saying nobody's coming with water or food. So they took it upon themselves to start loading up airplanes and, and um, bringing the items themselves, medicine, food, water. My sister has been helping out with that effort, making sure that they have enough supplies and enough funds to, to get the airplanes paid for and also trucks because the trucks have to drive the, the stuff from New York to Florida. And then from there, the flights go on. There's a lot of red tape going on. The United States government has failed Puerto Rico completely. Um, they don't put people first. They put money first. And that's what I've been noticing because while they were arguing over who's going to get what contract, for weeks people were dying. And this is in stark contrast to what I saw happening in Cuba. They put people first. They plan way ahead of the game, and they save everybody. I mean, look at the losses in Cuba compared to Puerto Rico. 911 or more and counting in Puerto Rico of unnecessary deaths due to the, the lack of humanity, the lack of care for people, and uh, focusing more on profits. And speaking of that, there's something called the Jones Act. Can you tell us that, about what that is and how that has been impacting Puerto Rico? Yes. Um, the Jones Act actually slows down um, the delivery of, of the goods that we collected here in the diaspora from being sent to Puerto Rico. It slows things down. These are um, items that are absolutely necessary for survival. Uh, this Jones Act is an old colonial law from 1920 that basically um, tells uh, forces Puerto Rico to um, send any ships that have imported goods heading to the island have to turn around and go to Florida, empty out their contents of the, of the imported goods onto American flagged ships to then deliver the goods to Puerto Rico. It's like a monopoly of the shipping industry, basically. Um, and, it, and it's all on, on the backs of Puerto Ricans because the fees that get added on from these shipping transfers like this, they end up on the cost of the items that the Puerto Rican people receive. So a gallon of milk will cost $5, for example. And I understand you're going to a march this weekend that uh, one of the themes is that uh, no to the Jones Act for Puerto Rico. Yes, we are going to organize. We're trying to get our buses filled from Hartford, from New Haven, and from Bridgeport. The, the buses are being paid for by the Hispanic Federation uh, in Connecticut and also in New York. Um, I, I know that there's another bus leaving from Holyoke, Mass. Uh, if anyone is interested, contact me at 860-967-4990, and I can see if we can get you on our bus or if you're in Massachusetts in their, on their bus. Conne uh, New York has their own Hispanic Federation, so you should contact them. But... Uh, the Unity March for Puerto Rico takes place on Sunday, November 19th, and it starts at 10 a.m. in Washington, D.C., and we ask everyone to come and join us and uh, support Puerto Rico. Now, let's go back to Cuba. Uh, now, you, originally, you when you set this up, I guess, months ago, it was not a tour for hurricane relief because there were no hurricanes. So what are some of the things that were on the tour that were not connected with hurricanes? Well, we, we went to an amazing event. There were 60,000 people. Um, and uh, I want to show you. This is the invitation that we received. Each one of us had one of these. Without this, we could not go in. And it 
each one has um, our name handwritten and the number stamped on here. And for the tiny minority of our viewers, who is that person? This is Che Guevara. <laughs> <laughs> and the brigade that we went had uh, 21 different countries and 263 people, I believe. And uh, we were there in the footsteps of Che to learn about Che Guevara and his contribution to the revolution and to Cuban to Cubans' lives. And this is a big anniversary con concerning him. What, what uh, Anniversary yeah. of what? It's a 50th anniversary of the, the... It's a commemoration of the death of Che Guevara uh, in Bolivia. He was killed. Um, and so it was really going through his life and what he did for Cuba and also for the rest of the world. And did you get a flag while you were there? Yes, I got this awesome flag. <laughs> Let me show you guys. You want me to hold part of it? Okay. Let's check it out. Okay. So there were 60,000 people at this event, and that was amazing. And where was that? In um, Santa Clara. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we also went to to learn about the Bay of Pig invasion. There's a museum that we went and visited, and they have, um, uh, they ha we went to another museum that showed us about uh, an incident that happened. Uh, it was like part of the revolution, one of where they derailed the train, and then they ended up obtaining the weapons that Batista was actually receiving from the United States. Mm -hmm. So um, it was an interesting experience learning how they, um, got their freedom, how they became a sovereign nation. They, f they actually took up arms and fought. Was this uh, all pretty much the government's point of view? Were there other uh, ideas about Cuba from, I don't know, sometimes they call them dissidents or other socialists? There were other people um, around. Um, the bus dropped us off uh, in different places, and we got to speak to different people that had different views, so that was interesting because I think sometimes people think that the Cuban government is um, a dictator and that you can't speak your view, but they sp I spoke to people in the streets about their views, and some people, there were a few people that wanted to to know what it's like on, in the United States. You know, they're interested. Um, the embargo that the United States ha has on Cuba uh, causes great suffering because it, it affects their economy. And so I see that um, there's, uh, there's, it's a third world country because of this embargo. And so, um, you know, people, some of the people uh, are living in, in a, a difficult situation as far as uh, the poverty goes. But the, the truth is that the Cuban government gives them Ba the basic necessities of life, things that Americans here don't have, like health care. They have free health care, free dental care. They have, for example, I pay, we pay a lot for orthodontics. They, everyone has beautiful teeth over there. They get um, free orthodontic care. Uh, and also students get to go to college for free, whereas when I have to pay for my kids to go to college, it's going to be way up there in the maybe 50 or 60,000 by then. Or they'll come out with 50 or 60 or $100,000 worth of debt. Exactly. That doesn't happen in Cuba. And they also accept students from around the world and give them a free education too. So it, it just made me wonder, how does a third world country pay for all this? How, how does it provide this to its citizens when, when a rich country like ours we're struggling? Like people, people don't have free insurance or free... Free health care, free um, education, um, housing that is based on your income. Uh, it's, it's something that I was wondering a lot, like how, how do they do it? And the answer is that Cuba had a separate revolution and they have a socialist government which takes anything that the workers make of course, the workers get paid uh, a salary, but then what the companies make uh, are nationalized. So, the the funds that the that are generated by the companies um, get put towards the people's needs. Um, over here, 
those funds, for example, from those from companies, end up in the pockets of uh, a very few families that are at the top percent of. of um, yeah, recently figures came out that three people in the United States have as much wealth as I think 150 million people wow. in the United States. A little bit of inequality. Yes. Uh, well, we we need to close up. Uh, did you when we talk about hurricane relief? In the preparation, you talked to me. You did some physical labor for oh, it. Yes. What did you do? It was um, we were sweating so much because the, the sun was very hot. So in Cuba, the the same thing happened in Puerto Rico where the crops came out, and so they lost most of their crops. They were washed away by floods. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what we did was we helped um, remove debris, ro- heavy rocks, debris. We were preparing the the soil for the new plants that we're gonna be planted we also participated in planting and also weeding um you know removing the weeds Mm -hmm. from the gardens um they also the one group they had machetes and they were removing vines that were sort of strangling the yucca plants and so that's what we did we worked in organoponic uh gardens cuba has provides organic food for everyone on the island, and it doesn't cost them like over here, where I have to pay extra to feed my kids. Organic. It's all organic. They don't use fertilizer or chemicals. I went all the places that we went, and it was all organic. Uh, that was interesting. So you were there two weeks. Um, yes. You recommend other people go to Cuba? Yes, in May there's going to be for May Day uh, another group going, uh, another brigade. Whoever's interested. Uh, you can either contact the Greater Hartford Coalition on Cuba or contact me at the number that I provided. Um, please, you're welcome to come. Um, I'm going to try to go with my daughter and my husband and son. Well, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you, Stan. Mm-hmm.